how, how do we and can we use hypnosis uh, to treat serious problems in medicine? What is it? Hypnosis is a state of aroused, attentive focal concentration with diminished peripheral awareness. How many of you have been hypnotized? Any of you had experience? There are a few who have. So you know, you don't go to sleep, despite the common root in Greek, hypnos for hypnotic, we use it for, hip, for sleeping pills. Uh, but hypnosis is not sleep. It's a narrowing of the focus of attention. It's something like uh, getting so caught up in a good movie that you forget you're watching a movie, you enter the imagined world. Hypnosis is to consciousness what a telephoto lens is to a camera. What you see, you see with great detail, but you're less aware of the context. And I'll try and show you what we think is some of the neurophysiology underlying that. In conjunction with this absorption, you have dissociation. So you put outside of conscious awareness things that would ordinarily be in consciousness. Right now, for, we all do it all the time. You're having sensations in these wonderful chairs the government has provided. Hopefully, that, those sensations were not foremost in your mind until I brought it to your attention. If it was, you can leave now. But we, in, in the service of focusing our attention, we put outside or, or of conscious awareness things we would ordinarily be aware of. We call that dissociation. The third element, and the one that scares people the most, is suggestibility. The idea that you can make somebody into a robot and make them do anything you want. It isn't true, but what is true is that people in hypnosis are less likely to critically judge what you say to them. You've got to be careful about what you say because they're less likely to correct your mistakes. I think it makes people nervous because we are all social creatures. We all respond to social cues, and sometimes we do so irrationally. Uh, and so hypnosis is kind of a limiting case example of how much we can allow input from other people, even people we don't know very well, control our behavior. We've all had the, it seemed like a good idea at the time, moment in our lives, I'm sure. Hypnosis is one of those situations where you're more likely to do that. And I'll show you some of the underlying neurophysiology perhaps related to that. We also use hypnotic-like states in other normal activities. If you are hypnotizable, you will be using that ability uh, in a variety of ways. So this was from the Times about the... Um, the Sochi uh, uh, Winter Olympics, a number, the, the snow was actually very bad, and so they were not allowed to make many practice runs on the actual courses. So what they would do is stand there and intensely visualize uh, going through the courses. And they say you have to smell it, uh, Emily Cook said. She was a freestyle Olympian. Um, it's beyond visualization. You have to hear it. You have to feel it. Everything. Um, and Bode Miller um, practiced mentally going down the hill, and they found that it really helped them control what their body did by going through mentally what that experience was. Our brains are built to do that, and this, is, from my point of view, is a state of self-hypnosis. Sometimes eyes closed, sometimes eyes open, but I'm always kind of zoned out, said another Olympian. So that's what people do naturally when they want to enhance performance, and there are good clinical applications of that as well. The next major concept and something that differentiates hypnosis from other mind-body techniques is that hypnotizability is a stable trait. Now, it changes in the lifespan. So, so most eight-year-olds are in trances most of the time, as you know, if you call your kids in for dinner and they're out playing and they don't hear you. But by the time we go through adolescence and start what are called formal operations mentally, we tend to settle into a very stable degree of hypnotic responsiveness. About a third of the adult population just isn't hypnotizable. The rest somewhat, about 10 to 15 percent, very hypnotizable. And the test-retest correlation in a study done at Stanford some years ago was 0.7 over a 25-year interval, blindly retesting hypnotizability. Now, IQ isn't that stable uh, over a 25-year interval. So it becomes an amazingly stable trait and I want to show you something about the brain biology of the stability of hypnotizability. So this is just one distribution of scores, a little cluster at the lower end, about two-thirds of the population, at least somewhat measurably, measurably hypnotizable. 